points. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. It would have been awful if it was like crickets. Um, so thank you. Um, one thing we're going to be doing as we look back today is uh, playing a few tracks or snippets of tracks from my upcoming or the upcoming album. I'll just tell you a little bit more about myself. I don't always play music. This past year I've been contracting with a startup called Reverb. They have a news discovery app. The iPhone version just shipped. The iPad version shipped in November. It's in like the top 10 news apps that are free, so feel free to download. The other thing I've been doing most of my adult life, I spent 15 years working at Apple. Um, although I didn't start working at that Apple, I started working at that Apple. Um, and so a few weeks before the conference, chatting back and forth and thought it would be nice at the end to kind of do a little, a little look back, maybe a little bit about the week, but even maybe a little further back considering that I've had a chunk of time hanging out at Apple. Um, and my talk was coming along and then suddenly on Monday morning, I got swifted. I think we all got swifted. And how do we feel about that? Awesome. What's that? Oh, you're not a Swifty? That's OK. Um, so I had to reconfigure, think about things a little bit more. But it occurred to me that with the introduction of Swift as something that is trying to take the things we like about Objective-C move them forward, modernize them, be more powerful, be more safe, all the good buzzwords. Um, that really, in a sense, at this very year, we're kind of looking at sort of the, the beginning of the sunset of possibly Objective-C at Apple. And that made me think back to the beginning of Objective-C at Apple, when this was suddenly in the next.com website when Apple and Next announced their merger. And that happened on December 20th, 1996. Is this picking up OK? OK, great. Um, and those two companies came together. And they put together with Next technology, with the Mac OS interface and a lot of additional new ideas, they put together Mac OS 10, 10.0. However, between. That didn't come out until March 24th, 2001. So you might be asking yourself, OK, so since, since the end of 1996 till the beginning of 2001, what were folks doing during that time? Obviously, there was a team of folks that was working on merging the technologies, coming out with Mac OS X. But for instance, what was this guy doing during that time? Um, well, Mr. Craig Federighi was working on a product called Web Objects. Anybody familiar with Web Objects? A couple of folks, yes. And in fact, he's, his big uh, contribution, or the biggest contribution, something called the Enterprise Objects Framework. And now, what was this guy doing during that time frame? Remember this guy from? Well, he was also working on a thing called Web objects. And you also saw this guy earlier in the week. And Matthew Furlick was working on something called web objects. Now, from that slide, I can't really prove it, but that's the prior slide in the presentation. And did you know that in 1999, web objects was Network Computing's Well Connected Award winner? Along with substantial power and flexibility. It brings an ease of development rarely seen in industrial strength development environments. Wow. Who else was playing around with web objects at that time? Here's a name you might find familiar. Um, and you might wonder, well, why are all these folks doing web objects? Well, from that time between late 1997 until Mac OS X shipped, there was a lot of secrecy. You know. Developed in secret, we're all blown away when Aqua came out. We're like, lickable buttons, what the? Um, sheets, translucency. 
We have that again now, translucency. Um, but web objects was really the only thing from Next that was still public and being publicly done. So Apple had contract or consulting engineers like Matthew Furlick going out and building websites for clients. It was the only way that if you were a Next developer that you could go out and earn your money during that time was doing web objects. And a lot of great minds and great folks that we see today on stage at WWDC were doing web objects at the time. And in fact, um, also doing web objects at this time was this guy. And he's a guy that I call Past James. Hi, Past. Everybody say hi to Past James. Hi, Past James. Oh, boy. And actually, while we're at it, since we are being recorded, let's all give a, a holler out to future James, will we? On three, one, two, three. Hi, future James. Thank you. He appreciates it. I know him pretty well. So what is this web objects thing? I went back, and I'm going to have past James tell you for a couple minutes just what web objects is. What is web objects? What's an application server? Let's answer those questions by looking at what you want to create. You want to provide a service on the web, either in-house over an intranet or around the world on the internet. You need to build an e-commerce site, an HR administration site, a database client, travel, banking, workflow, an internet portal, dynamic publishing, whatever it happens to be. Each of these services is a piece of software, an application you need to make available on the web. In order to make this happen, there are two important things you have to do. You have to design and develop the application itself. <laughs> then you've got to deploy it, put the application on the web, let people access it, and ensure it handles the traffic. There are two important tasks, develop and deploy. Web Objects is designed from the ground up to help you perform both. Number one, Web Objects is an application development studio. And number two, it's an application deployment environment, otherwise known as an application server. Let's look at each part in turn. First, developing the application. Every web application needs two things. It needs seamless access to a database or even multiple data sources. And it needs a way to integrate with the web, generating dynamic web pages and keeping track of each user's information. WebObjects provides an elegant infrastructure for handling both of these requirements transparently. WebObjects uses object-oriented frameworks to handle these tasks. The Enterprise Objects framework handles database access, including multiple data sources simultaneously. The WebObjects framework generates dynamic web pages, handles requests from web browsers, and maintains each user's data, integrating your application with the web. Out of the box, without additional code, these frameworks provide the functionality to allow multiple users to view and edit database data on the web. All web applications need to handle these tasks, so WebObjects provides a robust platform to build on. The code that you write focuses on the unique pieces of your application. What makes each web application unique is its business logic and application logic. Business logic are the objects and rules of a particular business. For example, an e-commerce application might have customers and products and rules on how they relate, while a project tracking application might have projects and tasks. Application logic determines how the user moves through your web application, the dialogue between your application and the user. An e-commerce app might have a series of pages to gather customer information, while a travel application might have pages to find comparative flight information. Web Objects allows you to implement your business and application logic in fully object-oriented code using Java. You aren't embedding logic or SQL directly in your HTML or embedding HTML and SQL directly in your code. Your development environment is abstracted from both the database and the web. Since Web Objects takes care of the generic infrastructure, the SQL to access the database on one hand and generating HTML on the other, you're free to focus on the area that matters to you most, your custom logic. You create your application with visual development tools in Java using the suite of Web Objects tools. Project Builder, where you manage your project's resources and edit code. EO Modeler, which you use to connect to and model multiple data sources. 
and Web Objects Builder, which you use to customize the appearance and behavior of HTML components and application logic. And so for creating web applications, Web Objects is a mature application development studio consisting of integrated tools and object-oriented frameworks. Thank you, Cass James. Um, so I know what you're thinking. All right, it's 2014 and you're making me sit through a sales pitch for web objects. What's up with that? Um, well, we're going to skip the deployment stuff because that has always been boring and probably will always be boring. Um, but web objects, you'll notice, first of all, the Java. When Next and Apple merged, Objective-C was what web objects was written in. But the world at that point was looking at Java. So the question was, might we be moving the entire platform to Java? Next had already come up with an Objective-C Java bridge where you could write Java code and it would bridge back into Objective-C. Um, and you could use both. There was a big movement, and you may have seen these t-shirts around the time, uh, to keep Objective-C. Um, and in fact, the platform, Mac OS X, chose to keep Objective-C, whereas WebObjects chose to rewrite itself entirely in Java, native pure Java. So many people say that the Enterprise Objects Framework was really the crown jewel. This way of, a, of an object relational framework where you're hook up to the database, get objects out of it. Um, and way back in 2001, I was so excited, I did a talk about EOF at WWDC, and I wrote a little song about it. Now we've recorded it and we'll put it on the album. It's called the, the Fetch Spec Song. And um, wait a minute, because not everybody's familiar with EOF. We're going to go into the subtitles. And we're going to turn on the core data subtitles. Because um, you'll see the two are very close. Let's head on back. And uh, we're about to play. I'm going to disconnect the uh, audio here. We good? All right. Get that out. So this is a snippet of a track from the upcoming album. I guess I've never really said that before. And actually we'll proceed to there and See how this goes. We hear the fit specification specifies those objects you want to fetch as its name implies. With a fit spec, maybe you can't stimulate those objects you want to fetch and manipulate. Yours, yours, yours. Whenever you fetch, you're going to get some of those. Fit spec, it helps you specify those objects you want to fetch. Should the need arise, a fit spec, it helps you stipulate those objects you want to fetch and then iterate over each object in the array. Yeah, 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 over each object you want to display. objects are they gonna be well you gotta specify the entity and the criteria for what you desire you're gonna wrap that all up into a qualifier and don't forget about the sort order rings determines the order of objects the fetch that will bring And that's a little snippet of the Fetch Spec song from the album.
If you ever do, and please don't, go back to the original WWDC recording. You'll far prefer this one, I assure you. So, we kind of lost EOF. We went Java when we're talking about Objective-C. But, most certainly, it's very easy to see the influence that Objective-C, or excuse me, the influence that EOF had on core data. And in fact, even that song, if you're at any of the CloudKit sessions, you'll notice the way we query things is also using a predicate and the name of the class, and it's very similar. Once again, there's this through line, something way back when keeps showing up again and again in slightly different formats that don't rhyme nearly as well. Um, as a matter of fact, being an EOF user, and then Mac OS X came out, we didn't have access to that functionality for a while. And so I was extraordinarily excited when Apple did announce Core Data in 2004. Um, in fact, I was so excited, I wrote a song about that too. It's called Modeling Man. And let me, oh, I think I forgot to stop or something, okay. Let's get this going. When? When? What's going on here? Uh, sorry. I think when does it seem to be, want to go? Is it in there? Is it moving? You got something? Uh. Oh, I see what I'm doing wrong. It's so intuitive. <laughs> I got the wrong. There we go. Well, an entities are right by me, it's what things supposed to be. What type, what saw, what class, what kind, whatever you might have in mind. Pick a name after a class, now your mind has grown fast. You work some more and come to grips with after this relationships now, baby. Now you're modeling too. Oh, baby. No, not the kind that they use in Monopoly Use the terms with precision Don't use them sloppily Our confusion will ensue Like episodes of Three's Company Modeling man, I'm a modeling man They say, are you in modeling? I say, oh yes I am There's no photographers involved In the modeling I do I got to down my everyone I send my headshot to Stop that. There we go. Groovy. Thank you. So, yes, uh, also past James. Um, a different one. So, another thing that came out of EOF was something called EO Interface. And it allowed you to hook your, at that time, OpenStep UI up to a database. And as you fetched rows in, tables would automatically populate, and you'd select items, and the text views would automatically populate. And I got very used to that. Um, in fact, at the time within Apple, I had written a tool which was Coco Java, which was writing a Coco app using the Java bridge, a Coco Java EOF app. So I was kind of at the intersection of Apple's least, per, least supported technologies there for a while. Um, and so, again, thrilled as I was, in 2003, when Cocoa Bindings was released. 
which inspired me to write another song. And that song was called Model View Controller. Um, so we're going to just play that one now. So your brain does not explode well, To achieve reusability You gotta keep up them boundaries clean Model on the one side, view on the other The controls in between Model view Yeah, it's got three layers like the Mario's do Model view uh, controller, yeah Model objects represent your application's raison d'etre Custom classes that contain data, logic, and etc You create custom classes in your app's problem domain Then you can choose to reuse them with other views But the model objects stay the same You can model a throttle in a manifold Model the title of a two-year-old Model a bottle of fine Chardonnay Model on the glottal stops people say Model the cattle in a boiling eggs You can model the waddle in Hexley's legs Model you Yeah, you can model all the models of post for GQ Model you That's a snippet of that one. So, so far, a number of songs written there. And actually, I think everything we've heard is something that lived in EOF or lived in web objects that somehow made its way into our lives later on um, in a slightly different form, in a slightly different way. But somehow these things keep popping up. And so do, and songs keep getting written about them too. Now, there's an odd thing that I discovered this week um, after Swift was developed. Somebody mentioned something that made me think of something called WebScript. Anybody familiar with WebScript? Two people, three people, fantastic. Um, so WebScript, well, back in the day, again, there were heady times when Next and Apple joined, and there was a lot of discussion. Are we, maybe things will move to Java. Maybe we'll stay with Objective-C. And there was talk at that time of Objective-C with a modern syntax. And actually, WebScript was a scripting language, interpreted, but it only dealt with objects. It handled memory management for you. Um, everything was typed as ID, so you didn't have any classes. Um, what else did it do? And you could run it and not compile. Um, you could do it more interactively, which sounds a little familiar. Um, WebScript shipped. And from 1996 documentation, I found a section, still up on Apple's website under legacy, about WebScript and its modern syntax. Now here's the thing that kind of blew me away. First of all, this is 1996 documentation of WebScript's modern syntax. That's what a function looks like modernized. Kind of looks familiar. Uh, just an extra shun from something we've seen surprisingly this week. Um, here's a couple of others. If there's no argument, okay, we kind of expect that. There's one argument, okay, we kind of expect that. But then this last thing blew my mind, because I found this in documentation of something Apple publicly shipped to people 
1996. So, except for those equal signs, that looks really familiar to a bunch of stuff we've all been reading about and hearing sessions about this week. Um, are your minds blown? Um, I don't even know what to say after that, to be honest. Except for the fact that, one, we've kind of had this arc of things where that next acquisition, that purchase, we've been pulling stuff out of it all along. Sometimes without even realizing it, like this is pretty subtle. What blows me away about this is that one of two things are true. Either this thing has been kicking around in people's heads for, what, 14 years? No. 18 years. And finally have sprung to life, which is pretty crazy to think about. Or, even crazier, a group of people independently arrived at almost the exact same thing when they thought about how do we make Objective-C a more modern language. I don't know the answer, but either way, that's pretty wild. Which leads us back to Swift. Um, a lot of great stuff was announced this week, but no doubt this is by far the most fundamental shift um, we really are seeing this end, I believe, of this objective C time at Apple, where things look like Swift will be swiftly adopted. Um, and it's not like we'll drop doing objective C, but I just wanted to take this time today to take this brief look back. So thank you. So I'm a little short on time. Uh, we have some time left if there are any questions about anything at all. There's a question. Since clearly you've been able to not only predict the future, but go into the future and make it manifest, how long do you think uh, before classic Objective-C syntax is reborn as the, the new modern language after people get tired of Swift? I have that I don't know. I, it, I don't know. I don't even have a funny answer for that. <laughs> I'm still freaking out over looking back at that 1996 documentation saying, wait, wait a minute, something's familiar here. Any others? Anything at all? Yes. So this is uh, more just a comment. Um, I actually still have those next introduction videos. And I've watched them many times back in the day when I was becoming a web objects guy. And I never made the connection that that was you on the, doing the voiceovers. Gotcha. That's awesome. <laughs> oh, so um, that, here, let's uh, I'm gonna break the fourth wall or whatever. The, so how did we get that crazy thing? This is Steve Heyman. Oh, no it's not. He's still hidden. Let me unhide him. Don't screw the slide. So at the Cartoon Art Museum, uh, next fundraiser, I had completely forgotten I had done these things. So as current you, especially if you're, say, in your 20s or so, um, the things you're working on today, 20 years from now, you may not even remember that you did them unless somebody reminds you. Um, Somebody reminded me of that, and it struck me, you know, if, I'm bring, if things are tying back to web objects, it would be good. I emailed Steve. He's up in Ontario, and within 10 minutes, he had sent me this picture that he had found the CD. Because I, I, believe it or not, don't carry it with me when I travel. Um, here, it, oh, I have it right here. Uh -huh. um, it also was done in Flash and brought into QuickTime, which hasn't played in QuickTime for like half a decade, a decade. So then I, have, I had somebody else who has a nine machine able to spit out the video. It was, it was a whole operation. Um, just to show you that awesome, awesome animation. Oh, which by the way, if you ever need a cheesy animator, I'm your guy.
because <laughs> that was all me. Um, any other questions? Yes. Hi. Um, it's, you know, I, I guess, oh, is this working now? Okay. Um, when Swift was announced, there was kind of a lot of, you know, reaction and a lot of people, you know, getting excited, but people also getting nervous. Um, can you kind of talk about what it was like the other times that these new language developments have kind of rocked everyone's world and, and what the reaction was? <coughs> well, I think um, the reaction tends to be, there's always going to be some folks who are always excited about something new. There's always going to be some folks who are like, oh, got to do something new. I just got used to the old thing, now I gotta do new thing. And I think all of us have a little bit of that. Like, I know when I showed up on Monday morning, I wasn't thinking, oh, you know what, I, I know what I'm doing this summer. Um, learn a new language. Um, but I guess that's what I'm doing this summer. I think then there was a lot of, it was, there was an interesting combination because there were kind of folks who've been doing Mac stuff at Apple for a long time. The next folks show up, they have their framework. There's another, like, the next user interface was different than the Mac user interface. The scroll bars were on the, on opposite sides. Um, what was it? They had tear off menus. There were all sorts of things. So there was already a lot of debate about what was the right thing to do and how things were going to go. Um, and then at the same time, Apple was not the behemoth company that it is now. People, you know, there were covers, like the wired cover were just the Apple logo prey because Apple was very close to not being around anymore. Um, so in addition to those conversations, there was also the idea of how Apple was going to be moving forward in relation to just the rest of the world and staying in business. And... At that time, Java seemed to be where everybody was just heading in droves. And so Next had already made that step with their Java bridge. Um, and so it seemed like that might be the direction folks would go in. It turns out not. Um, and everything seemed to work out okay. So I don't know if that helps answer the question. The other thing I would say is, well, at least for me, like, over the years, like stuff new shows up. Sometimes you make that judgment call. I think this, for me, it's kind of the difference between does this thing feel more like Objective-C garbage collection or does it feel more like ARC? And for me, when they first told me about garbage collection, I was working at Apple, so I needed to make things garbage collection safe in AppKit and what have you. But in the back of my head, it just it didn't feel right. It was like, this doesn't feel very Objective-C-ish. Whereas the minute they described ARC, it was like, oh, that's exactly what you should do. Of course, that makes, it feels so right um, that I switched immediately. Whereas if I had just heard the garbage collection pitch and I wasn't working at Apple, I would have kind of hung back. This to me feels like one of those where you, you got to just go. It's, yeah, this is where we're going. Um, Chris Latner hasn't steered me wrong yet. Any others? So I guess uh, I guess we have a lot of questions on kind of the same same thread. This is another Java one and Swift. Um, you know, as recently as 2010, Apple published this document um, about Java platform on uh, 10.6. Okay. And they said, uh, I'm quoting here, uh, this integration brings together the Java platform's versatility and OS X's uh, advanced technologies to offer users wide selection of applications and developers a first class development and employment platform. And obviously, you know, even four years ago, that's, that's not really true anymore. Um, and you, so you, you really think that we're diving into Swift. It's the future. It's not going to be another faint in a different direction where, you know, then it's like, oh, actually, you know, garbage collection is now deprecated. Gotcha. Um, well, well, first, let me just absolutely clarify. I no longer work at Apple. So I've been, August is my third year, like, It'll be three years that, I, that I've um, been out doing indie stuff. So what I'm saying has, is not Apple saying it at all because they won't even let me in the conference. Um, <laughs> they'd let me in. I didn't get a ticket for the conference. It's not like there's a picture of me. Do not let this guy in. I think. Has anybody seen that? Um, I, it's just 
it's so strange that I always get this sense that with technologies, there's, you have a, sometimes you just, you get a gut feel, which as an engineer, it's like, we're not supposed to have gut feels. We're supposed to be all rational and what have you. You know, but then you listen to, or you read a bit of a VI Emacs thread, you're like, yes, we're all so rational. Um, <laughs> there's no emotion in play at all. Um, so for me, it's just a gut feel. That's, that's what it is. And it's also, I mean, if you look at the track record, um, this is kind of coming from the same folks that, have, that did do ARC. And even garbage collection, although it, in a sense, morphed into ARC, a lot of things that came out of that, like um, the zeroing null, nil pointers, which are incredibly useful things, and they wouldn't have learned how to do them earlier if they hadn't tried the garbage collection thing. So um, I think just the playground alone makes me think, oh, who's not going to want to use this eventually? You know. Now, that's not to say, I mean, there's what, 1.2 now million iOS apps and who knows how many Mac OS apps out there written in Objective-C. So I don't think that's going away like tomorrow. I think if you know Objective-C, somebody tweeted, I saw a tweet that said, can you believe that there'll be attendees at next year's WWDC who've never written a line of Objective-C code? And that made me think, oh, I know Objective-C. Do you realize there are over 1.2 million legacy application code bases out there that need Objective-C developers? Awesome. Um, uh, let's see, I don't know if that answers your question. For me, it's jump in with both feet. That's, that's for this, for me. Um, for like uh, auto layout, I waited like a year or so. Just because I knew it would take time to wrap my head around it, and I'm still working on that. I think there's a question in the back. I'm going to try to ask the question even with the voice. That's what it takes after five days. <clears throat> dub, dub. So first of all, thank you for being you, whether past, present, or future. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah. <laughs> so what do you think that um, they choose to write their own language instead of using something like, I'm going to take an example, my other programming language is Ruby, and there is this pretty cool thing called, used to be called Mac Ruby, which turned on to Ruby Motion, and they basically, as far as I understood it, um, stopped the project a while ago. Um, or more like, my question, I guess, is explain why they didn't want the Ruby or Python or another existing language. I have to say, I, I honestly have no idea. Like, I can't... I know, well, I think, I think it's no secret that Apple loves to control its own destiny. And my guess would be that would have something to do with it. But I honestly have no idea as to their, their motivation. And in fact, I've been busy like singing songs this week and refiguring my. So I, I, the only Swift session I've seen is the intro to Swift one. So I actually, like, I'm like five days behind all you guys. So, um, but I think I already have like two people endorsing me on LinkedIn for Swift, um, <laughs> which is awesome. Everybody cross endorse. Go ahead and do it. Um, but that would that would be my. I I don't know though. Any others? Obviously, ooh, there's a business opportunity. Oh, let's how let's do auto release. You know, because we don't want to get rid of it right now. But. In a, in a while, maybe it will, you know. Thank you for that lovely setup. That was fantastic. We don't know each other, right? Any others? Excellent. Well, I think we're just about four minutes until the, the slated end. So I want to thank you all very much. Um, for listening to my crazy conspiracy theories about web script. And um, everybody, safe travels to your home. I hope you've had a fantastic week. And um, I look forward to seeing you all next year. And um, oh, there's this album coming. Um, if you're interested, jamesdempsey.net, just sign up on the email list and we'll let you know. 
If you like the songs, if you like that kind of stuff, I would greatly appreciate it if you told your friends, pass the message along. Um, uh, there are nine million registered developers. And if like one in 10 of them kind of like those tunes, it's a heck of a lot of developers. Um, so pass the word if you would, I'd be really appreciate it. Thank you very much, safe travels home, and enjoy the rest of your day. Is this picking up okay? Okay, great. Um, and those two companies came together and they put together with Next Technology, with the Mac OS interface and a lot of additional new ideas, they put together Mac OS 10 10.0. However, between that didn't come out until March 24th, 2001. So you might be asking yourself, okay, so since, since the end of 1996 till the beginning of 2001, what were folks doing during that time? Obviously, there was a team of folks that was working on merging the technologies, coming out with Mac OS X. But for instance, what was this guy doing during that time? Um, well, Mr. Craig Federighi was working on a product called WebObjects. Anybody familiar with web objects? A couple folks, yes. And in fact, he's, his big uh, contribution, or the biggest contribution, something called the Enterprise Objects Framework. And now what was this guy doing during that time frame? Remember this guy from, well, he was also working on a thing called web objects. And you also saw this guy earlier in the week, and Matthew Furlick was working on something called web objects. Now from that slide, I can't really prove it, but that's the prior slide in the presentation. And did you know that in 1999, web objects was network computing's well-connected award winner? Along with substantial power and flexibility, it brings an ease of development rarely seen in industrial strength development environments. Wow. Who else was playing around with web objects at that time? Here's a name you might find familiar. Um, and you might wonder, well, why are all these folks doing web objects? Well, from that time between late 1997 until Mac OS X shipped, there was a lot of secrecy. You know, developed in secret, we're all blown away when Aqua came out. We're like, lickable buttons, what the? Um, Sheets, translucency, we have that again now, translucency. Um, but web objects was really the only thing from Next that was still public and being publicly done. So Apple had contract or consulting engineers like Matthew Furlick going out and building websites for clients. It was the only way that if you were a Next developer that you could go out and earn your money during that time was doing web objects. And a lot of great minds and great folks that we see today on stage at WWDC were doing web objects at the time. And in fact, um, also doing web objects at this time was this guy. And he's a guy that I call Past James. Hi, Past. Everybody say hi to Past James. Hi, Past James. Oh, boy. 
And actually, while we're at it, since we are being recorded, let's all give a, a holler out to future James, will we? On three, one, two, three. Hi, future James. Thank you. He appreciates it. I know him pretty well. So what is this web objects thing? I went back, and I'm going to have past James tell you for a couple minutes just what web objects is. What is web objects? What's an application server? Let's answer those questions by looking at what you want to create. You want to points. Awesome. Thank you. It would have been awful if it was like crickets. Um, so thank you. Um, one thing we're going to be doing as we look back today is uh, playing a few tracks or snippets of tracks from my upcoming or the upcoming album. I'll just tell you a little bit more about myself. I don't always play music. This past year I've been contracting with a startup called Reverb. They have a news discovery app. The iPhone version just shipped. The iPad version shipped in November. It's in like the top 10 news apps that are free, so feel free to download. The other thing I've been doing most of my adult life, I spent 15 years working at Apple. Um, although I didn't start working at that Apple, I started working at that Apple. Um, <laughs> And so a few weeks before the conference, chatting back and forth and thought it would be nice at the end to kind of do a little, a little look back, maybe a little bit about the week, but even maybe a little further back, considering that I've had a chunk of time hanging out at Apple. Um, and my talk was coming along, and then suddenly on Monday morning, I got swifted. <laughs> I think we all got swifted. And how do we feel about that? Awesome. What's that? Oh, you're not a Swifty? That's OK. Um, so I had to reconfigure, think about things a little bit more. But it occurred to me that with the introduction of Swift as something that is trying to take the things we like about Objective-C, move them forward, modernize them, be more powerful, be more safe, all the good buzzwords. Um, that really, in a sense, at this very year, we're kind of looking at sort of the, the beginning of the sunset of possibly Objective-C at Apple. And that made me think back to the beginning of Objective-C at Apple, when this was suddenly in the Next.com website, when Apple and Next announced their merger. And that happened on December 20th, 1997.